Hello students, this is Professor Chalai, and in this video we're going to talk about electron configurations. As always, you can follow along with our Chapter 6 workbook. By the end of this video, you should be able to draw electron orbital diagrams and also write electron configurations. Let's get started. And as we do, recall from our previous lectures, we talked about how when we solve for the wave of an electron inside of an atom, there are many different possibilities for our, sol our solutions, and the different possibilities are described by these different quantum numbers. And the only rule that we have so far is that no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. But then you might be asking, well, okay, yes, we know they can't have the same set of quantum numbers, but what set of quantum numbers do they actually get? Well, we need to find a way to figure out where, uh, what those electron, what quantum numbers elect each electrons are assigned, and that's the, that determines where the electron will be, right? Or what shape the electron will take or the electron orbital will take. And to figure that out, we'll look at the Aufba principle. Aufba is simply the German word that means build up. And so what, what this principle gives us is, an, is a way to build up the electrons in an atom, putting them in the various different quantum numbers of shells and subshells and orbitals and all that good stuff. And the principle states that we just don't put electrons in any old random orbital that we feel like. Electrons, like most things in life, are very lazy and so they just want to be in the lowest, they want to expand and have be in the lowest energy state that, um, that they can possibly be in. So in the off bar principle simply states that when we add, we add electrons uh, in orbitals, we fill the orbitals with the lowest energies first. That's the off bar principle. So now that we have an idea um, of what the different quantum numbers are and maybe what the energies are, we can just put the electrons and we know what, what quantum numbers they'll have now because we just put them in the lowest energy orbitals first. But that would mean that we need to know what the orbital energies or the, at least the orders of the orbital energies of the various different uh, shells and subshells that we have. And that's where this diagram comes in. Now, to build this diagram by yourself, so this diagram just, if you follow the arrow, you will go through the different orbitals from lowest to, high, to highest energy. And to build this by yourself in an exam, for example, where you might not have this to look at, I'll just simply draw a little table with the n values going down this way. So we'll have one n value, n equal one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'll uh, label the L values uh, going this way. We know L starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So if we're looking at labeling these subshells, if n equals 1 and uh, L equals 0, we know that's the 1s subshell. There's no other or uh, subshells in n equals 1 level. Here we'll have 2s and 2p and nothing else. Here we'll have 3s and 3p and 3d. Here we'll have 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. Here we'll have 5s, 5p, not a 4, but a 5. There we go. 5d and so on. Here we'll have 6s, 6p, and so on. These are, I'm just lazy and not filling those in, um, but you can do so yourself. And then what we'll do is just draw lines going from the upper right to the lower left. And then when we hit, uh, we're outside of the table, we circle back to the next um, next subshell and do the same thing until we hit the end of the table and you know we keep doing that over and over again. So let's see. So we'll start with the 1s subshell, go to the 2s, then go to the 2p, and then 3s, then to the 3p and 4s, then to the 3d, 4p, 5s, 4, 4d, 5p, 6s, 5d, 6p, sorry, 4f, then 5d, then 6p, then 7s down here if we included it. And that's how we get the energy orders. And just to uh, make it, just to write it down for you, we have the 1s, then the 2s, then the 2p, then the 3p, then the 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d, 4p. Those are the energy orders. Uh, I had a diagram earlier in this chapter where we look at the energy orbitals, right? This 1s, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, uh, then 3p, then actually 4s is higher 
then 3p and then 3d and then 4p right that's the energy or order but it's hard harder to remember it from this diagram than to just sort of remember it from uh, just doing this so know how to do this in order to remember this order because when we fill electrons right we're going to put it in the lowest energy or uh, orbitals first right so that'll be 1s then 2s then 2p where we fill it up going this way all right so the other thing that i want to point out is that this these energy orders are exactly how your periodic table is laid out you may not notice it but let's look at it. We're, so our periodic table will read from left to right and in one row, and then go to the next row and read from left to right, and so on. So if we read from left to right, we'll see we have hydrogen and helium. Those are two, uh, two elements, and basically uh, the electrons for those will fill the 1s. Um, the outermost electrons will be in the 1s subshell. Next will be the 2s subshell, then the three the two p subshell right and we know that for the s subshell there can only be two electrons in them for the p subshell there can be six electrons in them so while there's only two uh, rows for the s elements there are going to be six rows for the p elements and then we go to three s then three p right that's we're still following the order three s then three p then four s so we go in the next row there's four s then three d Right, so that's a whole new set. So we go back to 3D and then 4P and then 5S and so on and so forth. So right away, the, we see that our table, our periodic table is set up in such a way that all the elements that their high, where their highest electrons are in a certain subshell are blocked together. So in the first block, we have all the elements that end with uh, an S subshell. This block over here, all the elements end in a D subshell. So this is usually called a D block. This first one is usually called the S block. Over here, we have all the elements where the, uh, the P subshell is the highest subshell. So this will be the P block. And then over here, we have the F block. Right. So all the elements will be in the highest electrons will be in the F subshell. And to remember the numbers in front of them, the first row is 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, but there's a little bit of a difference here. We go from 4s right here to 3d. So we need to subtract 1 to figure out what the uh, what the end value is for the in the d block. And then over here we need to subtract 2 to figure out what the um, end value is for the f block. So we go from 6s down to 4f, up to 5d, and then back to 6p, right? That's how that works. And then from 7s, we go down to 5f, then up to 6d, and then here would be 7p. So that's how we can think of the periodic table in terms of electron orbitals and electron configuration. But what do I mean by electron configuration? The electron configuration is simply some label telling us how many electrons are in each of these different subshells. So there is two ways we can write that. We can either write all of the various uh, subshells and then use the superscript to write how many electrons are in them, or we can start with the largest noble gas that's smaller than the element we're looking at than the other, um, the other subshells and the number of electrons in them. So we know that helium has a configuration of 1s2, right? So instead of writing 1s2, we just write helium. In this case, it doesn't save us much time, but it actually will save us a lot of time um, when we in the future. An orbital diagram, an electron orbital diagram, is the same idea, but instead of just numbers representing um, how many electrons are in the orbital, we have boxes. Each box is one orbital. And so in the 1s subshell, there's one orbital. 2s subshell, there's one orbital. 2p subshell, p means l equals 1. So ml means could be either negative 1, 0, or positive 1. So there's three different um, orbitals. So each box is an orbital. This gives us a little bit more information. Not only does it give us the, um, 
the number of electrons in each orbital, but also the spin, right? You'll see I draw the electrons as either, as either a hop, up half arrow or a down half arrow. These correspond to the ms value, which we know could be negative half or positive a half, but the direction of the arrows don't matter. Like the up arrow is not negative a half or the down arrow is not positive a half or vice versa. The direction of the arrow means nothing. So now you might be asking, well, how do I know which direction to draw the arrows? Well, first, in each of the box, uh, the arrows must be in opposite directions because we know that the MS values can't be the same. They must be different. So in each box, the electrons will be uh, paired up with different spins. But what about these, right? Why did I draw them this way? Why didn't I draw them, let's say, I don't know, two up, an up and a down here, because we know it has to be different. But why didn't I do like an up here, maybe a down here? Why did I draw them the way I did? Well, that all depend uh, is dependent on Hun's rule. So Hun's rule simply states that, let me get it here for you, um, every orbital, is filled every orbital in a subshell so in a subshell is filled with one electron usually they call that singly occupied before we doubly occupied we doubly occupy the orbitals and singly occupied orbitals singly if i spell that right occupied orbitals should all have the same spin the same spin so that means that when we were filling oxygen, right, this is, this is for oxygen, we know that oxygen atom has eight electrons. So we'll start with 1s as the lowest energy orbital, then 2s, then 2p, right? And how do I know to stop there? Well, let's look at our periodic table. Oxygen is right there, so we'll need 1s, we'll need 2s, and then we'll need 2p. So we'll stop there, and we need to fill eight uh, electrons in here so let's do that one first so we fill them singly occupied first then we double up two three four for p orbital we fill it singly first five six seven all with the same spin so i would just put them as all pointing up so one two three four five six seven now we start doubly occupying them eight so this is how we get the electron orbital diagram uh, because we know that 1s is the same as helium, we could actually just replace this with helium, so make it easier in our life. So this means that the electron configuration will be helium 2s2, because there's two electrons in there, and then 2p4, because there's four electrons in there. All right, we're ready to do a whole lot of practice with electron configurations and electron orbital diagrams. Let's start with helium. Helium has two electrons, and we know that the outermost um, outermost orbital will just be the 1s orbital. So we don't need to write a lot for this. So we'll just draw, where are we? Here we are. We'll just draw the 1s orbital here. There's two electrons, one, two. So the electron configuration for helium is just 1s2. For nitrogen, there's seven electrons. Right, and the outermost um, orbital is the 2p orbital, so we can go 1, 1s, 2s, 2p. I know these are the energy or orders. If you didn't memorize that yet, you should, or you can figure it out using different charts. We need to fill in our seven uh, electrons, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. 2p3. All right, let's look at iron. Iron is a noble gas, not a noble gas. Iron is a transition metal, right? It has 26 electrons, uh, but I don't want to start from beginning 
to figure out all 26 electrons. So let's look at the periodic table. We see that iron is right here. So we can start with argon, which is the largest noble gas that is smaller than iron. So we can start with argon, which we know already has uh, you know, all of the configurations up to argon completely sort of built in. So we know that argon has 18 electrons already taken care of in its configuration. Uh, iron, we need 26 electrons, so we only need to talk about the other um, eight more electrons that we need to account for. So let's do that. So iron, where are we? Right here. Iron, we'll just start with argon in little square brackets, argon. And then what are the other uh, orbitals that we need to write here? Sorry, we're up here, argon. Let's look at our periodic table again. After argon, right, we'll start in this row, which has the 4s subshell, then the 3d subshell, right? Uh, let's erase this so you can see that's the 3d subshell. So 4s, then the 3d subshell. The 4s has one orbital, 3d has five orbitals. So let's draw those. So one orbital for our 4s subshell and five orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, for the 3d subshell. So we talked about how argon has 18 electrons already taken care of. So we need to fill the other eight. We fill in the lowest orbitals first, one, two, and then the other orbital we fill singly first, three, four, five, six, seven, now doubly, eight. So in iron, we have argon, 4s2, 3d6. Note that there's so many unpaired electrons in iron, uh, one of the reasons why iron is ferromagnetic. Okay, let's do iron 3 plus. When we're doing ions, you fill the electrons for the element first, and then you either add more electrons if it's a negative ion, or you remove electrons because it's a positive ion. So let's start with, for iron 3 plus, let's start with what we already have for iron uh, up above, which is this, right? And we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now to remove, to have, uh, to get an iron three plus, it means we lost three electrons. So we need to remove three electrons here. Now, some people might be tempted to remove electrons in the, um, in the order that we added them, like the reverse order that we added them in. But that's not always the case. In fact, uh, we tend to lose electrons from the highest n values first. So in this case, we'll probably lose electrons from the 4s first, then we'll lose electrons from the 3d. Um, this is going to be typical for most um, transition metals. So let's remove two electrons. We need to remove three electrons. So let's move these two. I uh, remove the box two, which I didn't mean to, and then remove one from in there. There we go. So this is what we end up with. We end up with an electron configuration of argon. 4s0, because there's now zero electrons in there, 3d5. So what did we do? We filled, we draw the electron orbital diagram the same way we did um, for the, the element that's not charged. And then to remove three electrons, we remove from the 4s orbital first, because it's the outermost um, subshell. Okay, let's think about f. Fluoride minus, F minus. Uh, helium is the noble gas that's just below fluorine. So from helium, we'll have um, 2s and then 2p. Helium has, let's use a different color. Helium has two electrons already taken care of. So for fluoride, uh, fluoride has, fluorine has nine uh, electrons and then, so fluoride will have 10 electrons. So let's build fluorine first. There's already two here, so we need three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That gives us fluorine the atom. And then to get fluoride minus, we need to add one more, 10. So the electron configuration here is just gonna be helium, 2s2, 2p6. 
All right, I hope this is becoming um, more and more straightforward. Please do a lot of these for practice. There's more questions at the end of the chapter as always. Uh, let's look at one that, uh, that's fictitious. Let's say there's some element called chalayam, because why not? I mean, I'm not in the business of discovering elements, but if I did, maybe that's what I would call it. Let's say the symbol is CH, and it's uh, element number 120. What would be the electron configuration? Well, let's look at what the previous noble gas is. So here we have ag agonesin that has an atomic number of 118, meaning that it also has 118 electrons. So we don't need to write all the different configurations up to agonesin. We just need to write the extra stuff. So we, need, we know we need to add two more electrons uh, to this configuration to get the configuration of this new element. And so that means we'll start a whole new row. And since this is the 7s row, it means that the new row will be the 8s row. So let's do that. Where are we? Here we are. OK, so we'll start with organesin, OG. And then we'll add a whole new row for the 8s electrons, and we'll just fill it with two more. So electron configuration for this new fictitious element would be OG 8s2. And this is the way that you can go about naming all sorts of um, new compounds, or not naming, rather, but figuring out the electron configurations of all sorts of new undiscovered elements. I should add, though, that this is not always going to play out exactly the way we think, because while these electron configurations work really well for elements that are sort of in the beginning part of the periodic table, they work a little bit less accurately for elements towards the bottom part of the periodic table, just because there's other things that come into play, like uh, relativity and other stuff. All right, so that's uh, electron configurations, orbital energy diagrams. And then for number 20, I would like you to think about quantum numbers a little bit more. And for, for example, for these, I would like you to write all the possible different quantum numbers you can get in those subshells. Uh, pause the video, try them out, I'll go over one with you. Okay, let's look at the 4p subshell and see all the different possible quantum numbers. So 4p means L n equals 4 and L equals 1, right? So those two are fixed, we can't change them. The other two uh, quantum numbers that are going to be possible are going to be the ml values, which can be either negative 1, 0, or positive 1, because L is 1, and then the ms values, which can be either negative half or positive half. So let's write all the possible combinations we can get. So n equals 4, l equals 1. We can get ml equals negative 1 and ms equals negative half. Uh, or we can get the same, same combination of things with ms equals positive a half. Or we can get the same combination of n and l because, you know, it's a subshell, those aren't changing. ML could be zero, and then here we'll have MS equals negative a half, and MS equals positive a half for the same combinations, so right there. And then for the same combinations of N and L, we could also have ML equals positive one with the two different values of MS again, negative a half and positive a half. So there we go. So if you look at this, we can see very quickly, or very slowly, really, that we can have one, two, three, four, five, six different possible combinations, meaning that we can have six electrons in 4p. Because every electron should have a unique combination of these four numbers. How many orbitals do we have? Well, an orbital is a unique combination of n, l, and m, l. And there is this one unique combination, two unique combination, and three unique combination we had three orbitals, which makes sense. Three orbitals, six electrons. Uh, so when we look at um, our p orbitals, right, there's three boxes with a possibility of fixing, fitting up to six electrons. All right, that will bring us to the end of this video where we talked about electron orbital diagrams. That's these little boxes that we fill electrons in or electron configurations, that's these letters and numbers that tell us where the electrons are. And we went over quantum numbers again by doing some more practice problems. I'll see you in the next video where we'll go over uh, how the periodic table can give us even more information about elements than we just learned even in this video. I'll see you then. Bye.